Okay, um, good afternoon and welcome to our workshop, Illustrating Identity, Tracing Art with Genealogy and Genealogy with Art. Uh, my name is Louisa Wood Ruby. I'm head of research at the Frick Art Reference Library. And before I introduce our speaker, I just want to tell you a little bit about the origins of the Frick's photo archive, whose material our speaker will draw on for his talk today. Uh, let's see here. The um, photo archive was begun by Helen Clay Frick, whom you see on the left-hand side. She was the daughter of Henry Clay Frick, who collected the paintings that you can see today in the Frick collection. Uh, she was very close to her father, and after he died in 1919, she was looking around for something to do with her life, and she decided that building a library um, for art research in New York would be of great use to art historians around the world, and certainly in New York and even in the United States. There were very free, few, if any, um, open libraries for um, the public that were devoted to art history research. The building you see on the right in the screen is the current day building. Originally, however, the library uh, was built in the bowling alley of the Frick Collection, which you see in this picture, and you see the pins in the, in the far back there. So uh, Mr. Frick would bowl there, and that bowling alley is still there today. The um, shelves have been removed, um, and uh, Helen Clay Frick um, first built one building in 1922 that's in the current um, that was in the current garden court, if you know the Frick Collection. And then in 1930s, when um, the museum became a museum, when the house became a museum after Helen Clay Frick's mother died, um, the uh, library was also built at that time. And both the collection and the library, which are contiguous, they're in the same campus, currently being renovated, by the way, um, were open in 1935. When um, Helen started her library, she collected auction catalogs, exhibition catalogs, catalogs, resume, monographs, all the kinds of materials that you would expect for our historical research. But she also realized that it was very important to collect images of works of art. Um, at the time, 1920, um, you know, photography was a relatively new art and a very expensive art. So it wasn't like, you know, we all have our iPhones and we can just take pictures if we go in a museum and take them home and look at them and think about them and talk about them. Uh, there were very few people who were rich enough, frankly, to buy a camera and take the pictures. So she, Helen Clay Frick realized that it would be of great benefit to um, art historians to collect photographs all in one place so that art historians could come in and look at those photographs all together and wouldn't have to take them themselves. So she started um, collecting exhibition catalogs, auction catalogs, etc. like you see here. She would buy three copies, one for the stacks, um, and then two so that if you had a picture on the front and a picture on the back of a certain page, you could have, um, you could cut that picture out and post it on this gray mount, as you see here, along with the information about the work of art, in this case, the Dutch artist, Albert Kipe. She had another brilliant idea, which was, she realized that all her friends or a lot of her rich friends had paintings in their hanging in their homes and that there was no way for art historians to go and um, look at them. I mean, they couldn't just meet everybody. Uh, so she thought, I'm gonna contact these people with all my connections and I'm gonna hire a photographer and go to these private homes and also small public collections, which were also not that accessible. And I'm gonna travel around or the photographer will and take photographs of works of art in private homes and public collections. So now this is in the twenties and uh, we didn't have super highways there and the cars were slow and the roads were rather muddy. So we have this picture from the Frick's archives of, uh, I think this is the first photography trip that they took. Um, this is not Helen Clay Frick here in the picture, but um, I, she might've been on the trip. I, I, I forget, I'm sorry about that. And um, they went to houses with collections of works of art. Uh, one of them was uh, the home, uh, a former home of uh, someone named King Carter, which you see here. His home was called Shirley in Hopewell, Virginia. And they took this photograph. Now, again, this is a photograph from 1922. So by now, the print is not doing as well. So it's, it's not wonderful. But it was the first time that this work of art was known outside of the family um, home. And the um, photo archivist collected 
information about these works of art. As you see here, reproductions, exhibitions, collections, a description. The description has color because as you see, the photographs were in black and white because of course, back in the 1920s, there was no color photography. Um, the art, the, um, the uh, photo archivists would collect this information and questionnaires that they had and type this information onto these um, cards. They're like six by eight cards. And they asked them the names of the artists according to the family, the names of the owners, the names of the sitters. And in that way, they collected all this very rich information about these portraits and works of art. Uh, Fast forward to the 20th century, 21st century, and we have entered all of these uh, works of art into our database. We have digitized the, the original negatives and we have entered all the information from the backs of those gray mounts into uh, these records, which is uh, you can find on arcade.niarc.org. Um, just look at Frick Art Reference Library and then look for photo archive material and you will find it. Um, and I wanted to just point out that they weren't all portraits, even though we're in a genealogy workshop. Um, there were also works of art landscapes. Like this landscape was a watercolor by Winslow Homer. Um, and just to say how sort of rare some of the material we have, this Homer watercolor, very famous artist, was basically unknown in the art historical world until very, very recently when finally someone realized, perhaps from coming to the Frick's photo archive, that um, this work of art that was in a private collection even existed, was not in the literature until um, somewhere in the past 20 years. Uh, some works of art they took photographs of were um, subsequently destroyed by fire. So these are actually the only photographs of these works of art that exist uh, to this day. Um, I love this slide. It shows how they, uh, the photographers would go to the homes, take pictures of the work of art, like on the left with a hole in it, however it was when they got to the house. Uh, and then the, the um, owners would uh, repair the work of art and, um, and then ask the Frick to come back and take another photograph. So you see that on the right, we see the before and after restoration. And this is a wonderful one, um, love to show. The holes in this painting were made by supposedly the bows and arrows of some young descendants of this member of um, Albany's very prominent Schuyler family. And here you see that, um, uh, we then later purchased a photograph of the work of art restored from the Albany Institute of History and Art, uh, where the portrait hangs now. And I just wanted to say that I personally got interested in doing a workshop of this nature. Uh, probably the first week I started work at the Frick Art Reference Library, which was a long time ago now, um, because I found these uh, images of my great, 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 great grandparents, um, Abraham Brinkerhoff and his wife, Dorothea Remsen, who were descendants of the Dutch who settled New York, um, replete with information like you see on the Gray Mount. And I was just taken and I just couldn't, I didn't know these portraits existed. I didn't know anything that's typed on these mounts. Um, these paintings are in, I guess, some far distant cousin's house. I actually haven't gone and looked at them yet, but I just felt this was so fascinating that, um, that genealogists should know more about this great resource. And um, the one thing is that the Fricks mounts, you know, they were, the, the information on the back of them that you see here was created by photo archivists over time, not professional genealogists. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went to Phil here, our speaker of today, and asked him as a professional um, to please tell us how we could take a search such as this further with the kinds of resources that he knows are available for genealogists. And similarly, um, how if you have a painting, let's say of a landscape, using genealogical resources can also help you understand that artwork and the artist behind the artwork that much better. Uh, to learn more about the Frick's Photo Archive, go to digitalcollections.frick.org. Uh, and we do have recent videos if you were intrigued by some of the things I showed you. The Photo Archive did two webinars this year on its highlights, and you can find those on the Frick website. So now I have the pleasure of introducing Phil Sutton, who is a master of, of this art. Um, Phil is a reference librarian at the New York Public Library, Irma and Paul Milstein Division of United States History, Local History, and Genealogy. 
where he also teaches and writes about genealogy and local history research. Sutton is a visiting assistant professor at Pratt Institute, where he teaches a class also in genealogy and local history. So welcome, Phil. I'm really looking forward to this event. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so um, thank you. So my name is Philip Sutton. Uh, I'm a librarian. I'm not a professional genealogist, but I work closely with professional genealogists and also with all level of research or all kind of, kinds of different people that are researching their family history. Um, New York Public Library, um, I work in the Irma and Paul Milstein division, which is US history, local history and genealogy. Um, in the Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street branch of New York Public Library. There we have about half a million books dedicated to our subjects. Many of those are family histories. There's also lots of published um, transcriptions, indexes, dictionaries, things like that of biographies and of resources all over the country, all over the planet. We provide access to about 200,000 images, historical images, mostly um, images of, of buildings, things like that. Uh, especially in New York City, but elsewhere too. We provide access to a lot of databases. Genealogy is big business. A lot of these databases are very expensive. So we provide access to databases like Ancestry, Fold3, Find My Past, newspaper databases, things like that. Um, lots and lots of genealogy source materials. We have the collections in the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society as well, or a lot of those collections. Lots of family files, um, Bible transcriptions reams and reams of microfilm, other archive collections, other family files, clippings, folders, city directories, you name it, anything that you might want to use. And um, one thing I'm interested in is, is, um, is, um, is sharing those collections, not with just with genealogists and local historians, but with people in other disciplines as well. Uh, and, and this is something that's come up during my career, I've had to, uh, on a number of occasions, give reference assistance to um, art librarians who were researching various um, things to do with their discipline. You can tell I'm not an art historian. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of those before we get into the, 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 my look at the Frick collection. Um, before though, if you're interested in genealogy research, if you think it will be a useful, um, tool to have in your research armory, or if you're just interested in family history full stop. There's a couple of things you can look at today. I'll put these in the chat at the end, actually. Uh, there's, we have lib guides and research guides uh, for genealogy research. Genealogy getting started at the New York Public Library research guide. It's a pretty comprehensive description of how to do research and the basic kind of records that you're gonna to wanna to use. And this is a lineup of the classes. We teach lots of classes. If you go to nypl.org events, genealogy essentials, or just Google that, you can see all of the classes that we've got coming up. And these are all online, especially um, during the lockdown while the library is closed to the public. Um, so lots of different classes on different aspects of genealogy research, but also on building research as well. Building research is the kind of um, the cousin of family history research um, because people lived in buildings, families lived in buildings. Um, and it's a popular research topic in, in local history. So gonna, what am I gonna talk about? Um, we'll take a quick look at what is genealogy in local history. I guess this is more review than anything, but let's, it, 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 I think it serves as well to think about it. Who serves genealogists? Um, if you're interested in genealogy research, it's good to know where the collections are, the kinds of people that can help you. Um, but it's also good to be aware of these whole other potential areas of research collections that you can use outside of genealogy. So if you're researching art history, I, I think there's a lot to be had outside of the usual art history databases and published works that you might usually use. Um, then I'm going to look at um, some examples. Very, this is all going to be very brief. Genealogy and local history resources. Examples of the kinds of reference questions that we get from uh, people interested in art. Uh, and then I'm going to look more closely at uh, a couple of examples from the Frick Photo Archive. And then hopefully we'll have time for Q and A. We will have time for Q and A. Okay. Okay. So what is genealogy? You probably know that, but. It's good to think about what genealogy is. This is something we do with researchers when they're starting out, is we get them to actually think about what it is. A lot of people in their guts, they have this feeling, I want to research my family history. 
Um, but what that is depends on you know what their goals are in the end. But really, literally, at its simplest, it's the study of multi generational family history, which which is about two things really. It's about connections, um, building pedigrees, family trees, that kind of thing, tracing your lineage back, um, researching names, places, and dates. And perhaps more interestingly, it's about stories. It's about family history. It's about if you have a pedigree. If you imagine a family tree or a pedigree chart as a skeleton for your family history, then the stories are what you add to that pedigree chart. Um, and that, that's the things that I think are more interesting. And th this is where we start getting into local history, US history, and other kinds of history as well. Um, in the library, we help all sorts of researchers, by the way, professionals through to beginners, um, because it is the United States' second most popular hobby, and we are a public library. Quick history of genealogy. Um, Starts out, um, it's to do with royalty, nobility, heraldry, connections, making sure that you know, you're not marrying someone you're too closely related to or proving that you're entitled to property or, or, or some kind of you know, um, aristocratic title. Um, looking at the colonial period, there's a little bit of snobbery. There's always been a bit of snobbery about genealogy, people with aristocratic pretensions trying to make connections to England, but it's also, at the same time, in, in the colonial and antebellum period, especially, we, we're looking at this kind of, I guess, a literature person would call it America writing itself. It's about religion and kinship, describing family, describing place, um, kind of celebrating the family, celebrating being American. Um, and this kind of goes in hand in hand as well. We, with, we start to see written and published um, family histories appearing you know, before the Civil War. The antiquarian movement is taking off local history. There are oral histories going on as well. At the time, if you're African-American and you're enslaved, you can't obviously write and publish your family history. So there's a tradition, an oral history tradition there, which is, which is key to everybody's family history. And then post-Reconstruction, we start to see a big rise in the celebration of the, the centenary of the United States, a big rise in interest in family history again, and US identity. Start to see genealogical societies cropping up, like, uh, the, um, the, like the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, for instance. Family reunions become a very kind of popular thing at the same time. And, um, but around the time of the 20th century, we start to see what you might call the democratization of genealogy. We, we, we see standards introduced, we see the beginnings of microfilm, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, are microfilming, getting involved with genealogy. And there's a huge boom in the 70s with the TV and book, uh, TV show and book Roots, um, which leads to a huge rise in the popularity of genealogy. The internet comes along, records are going online. Um, TV shows appear, there are conferences, lots and lots of small genealogical societies cropping up. And then an explosion when DNA comes along and, and the rise of genetic genealogy. It's good to know if you're going to get into this kind of research to think about the, the information landscape that's out there. There's a lot of historical societies that, that, that um, deal with genealogy. There's a lot of genealogical societies that came out of historical societies back in the day. Um, many public libraries serve genealogy researchers, especially um, research libraries. Allen County Public Library, Family History Library, and our own New York Public Library. Brooklyn and Queens have great collections for local history and genealogy. And, and we've seen a lot of community organizations, the Jewish Genealogical Society of New York, Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, many, many different um, genealogy groups, communities that you can reach out to and join. It's worth thinking about the genealogy research process as well. I'm going to kind of whip over this stuff a little bit because we're a bit short of time. But when you're doing genealogy research, there tends to be a process for it. And, and, and this is why genealogy research tends to be um, open-ended. But it's about formulating a question, which might be, when did my ancestor come to the United States? Find out what kind of record might have the answer to that. Let's say it's a ship's passenger list or a census. Determine whether that record exists. Uh, if it's a ship's passenger list, yes, from 1820. Where's that record going to be? Could be online at a database like Ancestry or the National Archives. You examine the record, and then based on that record, you formulate a new question. So yes, he came to the United States in 1919. I want to go. I want to know where they went now. Um, 
And I think it's this kind of thought process which can actually be useful when you're researching the biographies of artists or the lives of, of people that, that are in um, the subjects of paintings. And there are some basics to genealogy research. I'm not gonna talk about this too much. There are classes you can take in this kind of research, but generally we're talking about working backwards, writing down what we know, getting organized, evaluating evidence, talking to family members, working with librarians, taking classes, that kind of thing. And these are some of the resources that you might use in your genealogy research um, that I'm hoping that uh, might be used um, for different disciplines. So we've got censuses, um, the census is, is the key record, <laughs> it's the great record for starting genealogy research for all sorts of reasons, uh, which should become clear. Naturalization records, records of citizenship, ships passenger lists, other records of immigration, newspapers, archive collections in libraries. These are the family files that we keep stored at the, um, from the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. These are in, in the Milstein division. Uh, vital records, birth, marriage and death certificates, City directories, they're like a precursor to telephone books. They go back almost to the beginning of the United States. Different periodicals, we have maps, we have published family histories. All sorts of images can be useful for illustrating family histories and, and, and also providing information. Um, and in all sorts of other records, you name it. You think of any record that you might generate in a lifetime um, and then think about whether or not your ancestor generated those records, there's a chance that they did. And if you know what record you're putting into a modern record, what information you're putting into a modern record, you can imagine what your ancestor was doing. But I guess the clue to this kind of research is finding records. A lot of records have been digitized now. Um, Family Search, the Latter-day Saints um, genealogy database has a great guide to finding records. You name the question or the information you want, they'll suggest records that can help you find that. And this is something librarians do. Many records have been digitized. I'm looking mostly at digitized collections today when we do the, the deep dive into the Frick paintings that I'm looking at. And, and these are just some of the databases that are out there. There's many databases out there. I'm gonna briefly mention the census. The census is a great record to get started with. If you're writing a biography of somebody um, and you haven't looked at the census, you should probably go back to it and look at the census. This is a, a, just a, a random census page from 1920. Uh, and this is the information in that census. This is a census at the time. It, uh, this is a period when the country was very in, interested in getting information about immigration and citizenship. But all of this data in the census can lead to all these other types of records. And um, so a census is a great record to think about no matter what kind of research you're doing. Uh, it describes neighborhoods, it describes relationships, it describes ages, the work you're doing, where you're from, if you're a citizen, um, whether you own property, how much that property is worth, all sorts of information. And getting organized is key, I think, to genealogy research as well. If you decide you want to do that, this is the same of all research, I guess. There's a couple of documents that you can use or ways of organizing information. Uh, I mentioned the pedigree chart already. This is a family group sheet by Isaiah Wilson. He was an inhabitant of Seneca Village. Um, and this is his family. And this is his timeline. A timeline is a useful document. I'm gonna look at a timeline for one of the subjects today, that way of getting organized in describing the life of a person um, as you're researching them to make sure everything's in its place. And then of course there's narratives. You can start thinking about, well, I, I've made connections with the pedigree, how do I now move into writing a narrative, a family history? And there are different ways of doing that. You don't have to write Angela's Ashes. You don't have to write a scholarly account in the register style. Um, you can write a memoir. You can edit letters and diaries. You can um, create timelines. Uh, one of my favorite sorts of family history, which is I think is easy to do, is the pictorial history, where you just gather together photographs and paintings and then talk about those, put them in a timeline, and, and then you have a narrative. Um, as long as you're putting names, places, and dates, citation, as with all disciplines, is vital. I'm not really going to talk about the history of local history. I thought I planned, I, I, I had planned to, but uh, um, I, don't, I don't want to run on too long. But local history and genealogy go hand in hand. And, and local history we're talking about as a history of a place, a, a kind of smaller place, whether it's a town, a village, or um, a county, or even a state. 
Um, and it, it contains information um, that maybe the bigger international and national histories won't contain. And there's all sorts of resources that you can use that will talk about local history. And local history, when you burrow down into it, one of the components of local history is family history. There's also things like building history, um, history of, of churches and institutions, histories of schools, histories of medicine, crime, all these kind of things that go in in a community that impact a family history and vice versa. The family history is a part of local history, especially if we're talking about um, a prominent family or a founding family or a family that was the first to own property uh, that appears in land patents or, or was prominent in some way politically or something like that. Um, so there's a lot of crossover and a lot of other resources that you can use beyond the pedigree chart and, and the censuses, other records that you can get into. And, and local history really starts, it's, it's as old as, you know, almost as old as the country. It starts with the antiquarian movement um, in, in the early 19th century. It really starts, I guess, with people describing their own history in colonial times. With settlers would arrive in the country and start to define themselves. And within a generation or two, they're talking about history. And there's many, many resources. Um, you name it, how long is a piece of string? How big is a library? We've got published sources, unpublished sources, and other kinds of records. So published sources, encyclopedias, historical dictionaries, local histories, maps, photographs, city directories. Unpublished could be manuscripts, papers, yearbooks, paintings, of course, photographs, all sorts of ephemera. And there are million, lots and lots of other records as well, building applications, arch architectural drawings, taxes, you name it. Anything has potential to contribute to a narrative. And this local history and genealogy sources they have value in, in, in terms of inter, interdisciplinary research. Um, so these are uses of family history and local history resources. I know I hinted at this already. So all sorts of um, genealogy materials, resources can be used by historians of, of many different kinds of history um, from international and US history through, down to micro histories, histories of buildings and families and communities and, and, and institutions and things going on in a community. But they're also of great use to biographers. You can look in an old city directory, for instance, and find out how much a stagecoach cost in 1850. And also when the sun set, that kind of thing. A city directory will tell you that. City directory, a favorite tool of genealogy resources. A biographer can really, if they're you know, writing a novel or rather a historical novel, something like that, they can really capture a time and a place. And then architects use resources, all sorts of resources used by genealogists, so building history materials, but also censuses. Students of historic preservation, they get an idea by looking at the census, for instance, what community was like, is it working class, upper class. And um, artists are inspired. We, we, we have groups of art artists and art students who come in who use the kind of resources that we share um, for art projects. Um, because genealogy is is about the self and if you're you know thinking about the self or your community then while you're creating a work of art a mural for instance then these resources are useful and um digital humanities obviously this is if you're interested in the history of uh, let's say advertising is advert advertisements all taken from city directories um from the 19th and early 20th century how, how might an artist or, an, or a librarian or an archivist interested in art use these collections? Here's a really straightforward thing you might do. For instance, this is a passport application for Ber Bernice Abbott, a photographer. Um, she's going to Paris. And uh, I saw this and I was interested in Bernice. We have a lot of collections of photographs of her buildings in our collection, as, as do a lot of people. There's a great WPA work that she did. Um, and I found her passport application, and there she is in 1921. And then I noticed who'd signed it. Her witness was Man Ray. Um, and so this is interesting. So I, I look at a, I find a biography of Baroness Abbott, which says rationalizing she might as well be poor. There is poor here. 22 year old Baroness applied for a passport in late January 1921. Man Ray, swearing he had known her for five years, served as a witness. She told the State Department that she intended to depart soon aboard the SS La Touraine and traveled two years in France for the purposes of studying. It doesn't take a genius to work out that this writer has looked at this document. So immediately, you know, put two and two together. This is something that's in Ancestry, the genealogy database. A few questions that I've got. Um, I know some, um, 
some librarians at MoMA, and every now and then when, when they get desperate, they'll, they'll reach out to me. In this case, this is a Dorothea Lang photograph, uh, Klaus and Child and Mother, uh, 1930. They, they, the, the, um, the metadata librarian said they'd wanted to know who the child was. Um, they're having a little trouble tracking her down. Um, I help them find a descendant. They were able to contact the descendant and talk about the photograph and work out exactly who the person in the photograph was. So my genealogy research skills helped them improve their metadata. Um, a photograph of someone who's obviously an immensely important photographer. Someone in the library asked me, um, they had a, a research provenance a little while ago, a couple of years ago, we, the library, New York Public Library, had an exhibition of the work of Anna Atkins, um, the, the pioneer photographer. Um, and they were trying to, they were doing, um, the, for the exhibition, they were trying to work out exactly where all of the collections of Anna Atkins' work were. Um, it's a kind of provenance research. I didn't go into details. They asked me why, they said they had a question and I, it wasn't my job to say why. Um, so I did some research. They, they knew that, that there was, uh, they found this collection, it was donated, a book of Atkins' work donated to the Science Museum in Bradford, which according to their records was donated by Matilda Talbot in 1934. Talbot, big name in photography, William Henry Fox Talbot, had a daughter named Matilda, but she died in 1927. Um, and her mother's name was Constance. So they couldn't work out like who was this um, Matilda um, Talbot. And it turns out it was actually Matilda um, Gilchrist Clark, who was a, a niece of Talbot. Um, not a niece, um, a great niece. Um, and she'd become friendly uh, with, she inherited property owned by um, one of um, Henry Fox Talbot's sons. And when she inherited the property, she changed her name to match his. Uh, and I just had to trace through the censuses uh, and through a few estate claims and wills and things like that um, to find the answer to this. But then of course I go to uh, find a grave, the great crowdsourced genealogy database. And the, the information is, is there um, on a tombstone as well. She's the granddaughter of Fox Talbot, I beg your pardon. Here's another simple way, this is a fun way. They wanted to date this photograph. Um, that was easy. Uh, Paris dead. I need to find a newspaper called the Daily Something with that in the headline. Little keyword searching, we pull it the Daily News, uh, June 5th, 1940. So they were able to date this photograph, uh, which was taken by Helen Levitt. Another question I got that was a fun question, which I can't repeat because it's somebody else's research, but so I'm doing something loosely based on it, is they wanted to know what an artist saw out of their studio window. Um, it was a, a famous pop artist, um, and um, he, they, the, the, the researcher wanted to know what he saw out of that window. Uh, I didn't want to give it away, so I picked another artist from around the same time. So I had wanted to know what, what did Robert Rauschenberg see in the street when he was working with John Cage to create automobile tire print in 1953. And I took this quite at random. So I looked him up in, um, um, I think it was at, uh, I forget now where I got the source of the information, but I had an address. It was various addresses online of where his studios were. So I looked up the studio in a map. Uh, this is a fire insurance map and that describes the building that's there. I was able to use the block and lot number to find images of buildings. Um, this is an image of the studio. This is actually taken in the 30s, but you can see all sorts of businesses there. This is from our New York Public Library's collections. And then I went and looked at a telephone address directory from 1954, which was the time that this piece of work was being created, and then just looked up the names of all the different businesses. Um, so I could have a sense of what he was seeing out of his studio, what was going on in the street while he was creating this work of art. And then there are even photographs. So if you're familiar with the tax lot photographs, these were taken 10 years before that, or just over 10 years. But these buildings were largely still there. And the municipal archives photographed every single building in New York City or every lot with a building on it. In, um, for tax assessment purposes, it was a WPA project. So knowing the block and lot number of, of the studio, I'm able to just go across the street and compile this photograph of what Rauschenberg would have seen uh, approximately um, when he looked out of his studio window. And this is another collection I really love. Um, this is, at MoMA I helped a little bit finding out who these people were. This is a photo album put together by Blanche Parker that's on exhibition at the MoMA or was recently. And they were just trying to learn a little bit about who the people in the 
in the photographs were. But enough of that, I want to get moving. So Frick Photo Archive. Um, so Louisa asked me to look at the Frick Photo Archive as a possible genealogy reference tool. I was interested in sharing my knowledge of genealogy and local history research with students of different disciplines, as I've mentioned already. So this seemed like a good opportunity to try and do that. And this is a picture, this is a, a painting that was suggested uh, by Louisa. I said, okay, name a picture because there are very many paintings in this collection. So this is a painting of Mr. and Mrs. Richard Aldridge, uh, her name being Margaret Livingston Chandler, painted in 1910 by Lucia Fairchild Fuller, um, which is, if I can find it, um, also, you can see this, it's also replicated in her biography, just there. Um, or autobiography, which I shall read a tiny bit from soon enough. Um, as we know, these pictures have metadata on the back. Um, I hadn't decided at this point I was going to research Margaret. I was open to researching either of them. Um, the metadata on the back largely, as is with the case with Victorian and Edwardian men, talks all about the man and, and barely anything about the woman. Uh, Richard Aldridge is interesting. He was a music cricket critic for the New York Times, um, served on various newspapers actually. Um, and he also had some time in the military, um, military intelligence division during World War I. I'm gonna think of all sorts of records that I might find about him. Newspapers, newspapers, censuses, ships manifest, military records, his obituary, published family histories. But to be honest, I was a bit disappointed that it just says, you know, his wife was Mrs. Aldridge and before that she was Margaret Livingston Chandler. So I thought, well, I'm gonna research the woman. Um, because women often go missing in, in these 19th century, early 20th century records. And of course she's, I mean, no offense to Richard, and if any of his ancestors are watching, she's far more interesting um, as a person. So I'm glad I picked her. Um, painting was done in 1910. So my first thought as a genealogist is, what were they doing in 1910? I know there's a census at that time. So I looked them up, here they are in the census of 1910 in uh, what is their townhouse, which is, um, 317 West 74th Street. And here we see Richard and Margaret and their son Richard. And then we see a bunch of servants there. So it's immediately obvious they're quite well to do. They've been married three years. Margaret's had one child, one has survived. These are the questions they asked. Uh, he was born Rhode Island. She was born New York and, and their parents were all from New York. He's a music critic. And it says here, occupation none. This is, she, she might not be getting paid, um, but she is doing a lot. Um, as, as we shall see. A little bit about the house, um, 317 West 74th Street. It was, it's a house here. This is those tax lot photographs. I had a little trouble tracing a picture, but there's a picture of it here. And it's also, it's here in this, on this map, this fire insurance map, which is contemporary. Um, this is from 1911, so it's nearly contemporary. This is a photograph by Irving Underhill um, of the area in 1911. Um, which is taken from the Landmark Preservation Historic District report. And we can just see the houses here, but we get a really great sense of what's going on in the area. And if we expanded this map, we'd see a lot more that's going on. Um, the house was designed by Charles P. H. Gilbert. So of course, I think, well, I'm gonna go back to the census. Oh, look, Charles lives just around the corner. Um, and we can look at this whole census page and get an idea of the, of, of, you know, of the community they live in, there are as many servants living in this community as there are uh, uh, as um, people who aren't servants. So it's a, it's a well-to-do area. It's up by Riverside. You know, it's it's a highly desirable kind of Gilded Age place. Um, so that's good to know. That's good to get some sense of um, of where she is and who she is. There's a lot of published material out there. Um, Family Vista is a bio, an autobiography she wrote, which is fun. Um, she appears in other books as well books about the Gilded Age, Sergeant's Women, which talks about her sister Elizabeth a lot as a subject for his painting. Um, she appears also in Archie and Emily, Emily, Love and Madness in the Gilded Age. And she appears in bi biographical databases for suffragists and, and, the, and the history of women's suffrage. She's mentioned briefly in there, those as well, because she was involved with suffrage. We have a family file that describes her lineage, her lineage back to John Jacob Astor. Um, just here, so she's the, the, the great great granddaughter. And, and there's her family members, and that's nice. Um, I wanna expand on that. I say her lineage, this, this is how she's related to John Jacob Astor. I wanna look at a different lineage. 
Um, how am I going to do that? I, you know, I want to know who her father, her grandfather, her great grandfather was. So I'm going to look in the censuses. This is the simplest way of doing this. So 1900, we have Margaret Chandler, age 29. She's living with her sister and brother-in-law's family. She's a head of household and she's living at 317. And um, as you note, um, it says here that Emmett owns the house um, and he's a lawyer. He doesn't own the house. Someone's assuming that. Margaret owns the house, I think, at this point. Actually, maybe she doesn't. Maybe I've got it wrong. This is 1900. She owns it at some point. She definitely does. She buys it. Um, we go back to 1870. We have Margaret Chandler, age one. She's supposed to be born in October 1870. This census was taken in January. So I'm a little bit confused. That said, I've just realized perhaps why. This has an address in it. So this is the second enumeration of the census, which was taken much later in the year. So um, um, just to, this is just occurring to me right now. So she probably is right about her date of birth being 1870, um, but she's not one. She'd be like a couple of months old at most. But her father is John Winthrop Chandler. Um, his father was the Reverend John W. Chandler. I go back to 1850. And then uh, he's born in 1789. And then we go back to 1790. It's a bit of a jump. Um, we have to use other records. The census doesn't describe relationships or family members at that point. So we have to kind of jump around. But there's Isaac Chandler here. And Isaac Chandler here is, and, and when you do this family history, so sometimes you find things you might not want to find. Isaac Chandler here, he owns three slaves. Um, so that's another place where you might, another area that one might want to start doing research. Timeline, I created a timeline, Margaret Livingston Chandler, uh, as, as a precursor to starting to do the research. I'm writing down the things I know about her so that I can start looking for more materials about her life. And she had a very, very active life. She um, was a nurse. She volunteered. She was a volunteer Red, Red Cross nurse, uh, served in the Spanish-American War, the Philippine Insurrection, um, sorry, the Philippine-American War, um, 1902. She was also in China working as a nurse in 1900 during the Boxer Rebellion. And she contributed to, to nursing um, in, in many different ways in terms of writing legislation and then campaigning. And she ended up winning the Congressional Medal, uh, or, uh, which was awarded to her um, by FDR in, in 1938. And this is an incredibly unflattering picture of her. This is what seems to happen in newspapers. You could see she, these are not the same woman. Um, traveled a lot, as you probably won't be surprised. Lots of ships, passenger lists, lots of passports. Passports are great because they describe, um, they give you lots of details, kind of primary information, primary source information uh, that you might not get from a census describing relationships and names and also routes where people are going. So we've got, we've got the plan for her journey here. So she's planning on going to France, British Isles, Holland, Switzerland, Spain, Belgium, and, and uh, sorry, Spain, Belgium, and Switzerland. And, um, and she's also going with her sister, her sister Elizabeth Winthrop Chandler. These are other applications. Um, actually, no, sorry, this is from the 1930s. So this lists her children. So we have her children, Richard and Margaret, there. Earlier on, she's there are passport applications that, from the 19th century. She has several of those. And she always, nearly always seems to be applying at the same time as her sister Elizabeth, um, who was a muse for Sargent and has painted a number of times. Uh, according to her old her biography, Margaret says that it, it, it was at her insistence. Paint my sister, Mr. Sargent, I imagine she said. And what was travel like? Well, travel was pretty luxurious. I picked out one passenger list. Um, she's traveling first class, as you'd imagine. And these are some materials that I managed to pick out. Images of her, of the, I think this is the SSA Paris, the SS Paris. And this is a first class cabin. Um, this is from um, New York Public Library's picture collection. And this is, this is the interior. I mean, that's opulence, look at that. Um, if we traveled like that now, imagine. And this is, this is the Paris, and, and this is the wine list, and this is from our menu collection. This is a wine list from uh, SS Paris. So we get some kind of in, inclination of what her life is like. And she was also uh, a suffragist. Um, she had many, many titles, many, many different positions. She's head of the Women's Municipal League. Um, she was secretary um, to, um, I'm forgetting exactly what all her roles were, but she had very, very many roles. Um, contained in all these newspapers. She appears, she's uh, the Women's Municipal League. Um, she's the Equal Suffrage League. She was a member of 
um, a church, Episcop Episcopalians women's suffrage group, and, and the main um, suffrage group for New York City, which, which name is escaping me. Oh, she was treasurer for the Women's Suffrage Party in New York as well. And, um, and there's lots and lots of articles about her. And this is the only, this is a cartoon of her pinning, pinning a Votes for Women badge um, to a gentleman. This appeared in a Poughkeepsie newspaper. And these newspaper clippings, by the way, are from all over the country. So she was, a, she was certainly busy. And she was in the news a lot. She was in Society News. I think it was interesting. She opened up her home. Um, she's very into philanthropy. She opened up her home um, 317 when she go to Rokeby, uh, which is in Red Hook, which was the, the family home uh, that she also bought um, from her from her siblings. She'd open up the, the townhouse during the summer as, as an infirmary for sick children. Sick working class children were able to stay in the household. They had it, she had it refitted. And then during the summer, they, at one point, she also had sick children, working class children come and stay at Rokeby. Um, there. Okay, we're well, so running out of time a little bit. How, how long have I got, Louisa? Um, I think you have about, well, we have 11 questions so far. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe three minutes and then we'll Three see. minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So I've overrun slightly. Um, this is another work. I, I, so I'm looking at the subject of a paint there. I'm going to whistle through these. This is, I decided to research an artist. Um, and this is interesting because this is a guy who's, who's a painter, who's interested in landscape. Uh, he paints a lot of landscapes of a farm that he owned in Rockland County. He, um, he painted his family in the land that he lived on. Uh, and he's fascinating. And I wish I had a little more time to talk about him, actually. Um, but this is my fault. Uh, so I took this data from the back, um, some clues, and this is a painting. And, and the Frick Photo Archive has a number of his images. I'd never heard of him before, but I was interested in him because he, he describes Rockland County a lot in his paintings. Um, he's also an interesting person. He's, uh, he, was, he was an orphan, but his sisters, uh, he was related to the George Cohen, um, the, the musical empresario that everyone's heard of. And his sisters were, were all in his chorus. And this, I think, is one of his sisters in, in one of the choruses of 1916. And he worked as a... As a um, as, as an artist, as um, designing posters um, for, um, let me see, who was it? For H.C. Minor Lithograph Company in 1907. And the, 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 I know this from his World War I um, um, draft card that's listed on there. And, um, and so that's interesting to me. And he's working for this company as a print make, uh, making prints, designing posters. And, and at the same time, those posters are publicizing George Cohen Productions. And he's also a member of the Kit Kat Club, um, which is a club for artists. And it's there that he meets his wife. Um, he becomes very interested in landscapes. He ends up in Rockland County. He goes there for a summer school. He loves it. Him and some artists buy a house. They keep going there or they rent a house. He meets his wife through the Kit Kat Club as a sculptor and an artist. And they buy a house in, in Orangeburg um, after they've married. His wife's name was Ida Blessing. And they go to live there and they're there in 1920. And this is a photograph of the house they rented. But they later buy a farmhouse where they lived for 23 years. And during this time, Costigan is painting just his family and the land that he lived on and the land that he farmed. I can work out who the subjects of these paintings were. The census describes the names and ages of his children. And these are his children. So I know that this, this, this is his oldest son, John, uh, Rosalind and Elizabeth. Here's that painting. This painting here is, is of, of his wife, Ida, and, and John when he was a baby. I look at local history sources. Local history sources are pretty scant for this area. Um, I'll show you some maps in one second. Um, so his paintings become the local history source. This is fascinating for me because this is an area that's no longer there. This, uh, I'll, I'll show you some maps in a minute. So he's painting the land, he's painting his family. So this talks about family history, and it talks about a part of New York that is very, very different now. And, and, and local history is all about recording change. This is a map of 1900 that describes, this is their property just here, that describes the Hackensack Creek running down here. And it's a pre pretty undeveloped area. If we go to the 1938 map, these are both topographical maps you can get online, we can see there's a hospital, there's a country club, the house is still there, but they're gradually being kind of surrounded um, by buildings and, and development. And this is what it looks like now. This is the, the Lake Tappan Reservoir. The whole area was flooded um, during uh, the 1960s. And, and this is just kind of the edge of that. 
And this is roughly where they would have lived around this road here. The whole area, the whole woodland area is gone. Um, I looked up obituaries about them as well, the, the artist and the artist's wife, who was also an artist. Um, these, are, these appear in local newspapers. These aren't in the New York Times. So local history sources for their obituaries. I also found some other clues. I was wondering why, you know, the, John Costigan, the artist, who's, whose sisters all, who's, who lived in New York, who worked for a New York company, ends up out in the countryside, living on a farm and subsisting on the land. He does a little work for the WPA during World War II, but mainly he's painting and, and doing illustrating. Um, and I got to wondering, I realized he served in World War I. Um, what was his war service like? This is the next place I go to. I want to know what was his military service like? Does this play out with why he ends up in the countryside and gets away from all the excitement and glitz of, um, of New York? And um, so art is local history. That's what I guess that whistle stop tour was. This is a Hackensack Creek, which he painted. Um, this is um, 1922. This, this isn't the, the one, the, the image that's in um, the Frick photo archive. The image in the Frick photo archive is actually better, but here is that river. And I, I just think thinking about art now as family history and local history is, is, is super interesting to me. Um, and so sorry for that whistle stop to her through the end there. Uh, but I think this, this is an experiment. This is really a, a kind of exploration of the potential, I think, of, of art history collections and, and genealogy collections and local history collections colliding and, and, and maybe giving you a fresh take on looking at, at the, the work and lives of artists and their subjects. Well, thank you, Phil. I think that was wonderful. I think the whistle stop tour was, um, thank you for <laughs> finishing up just so we can be a little bit timely, but um, uh, it, it was just so interesting to see, um, you know, art uh, being studied through local history and, and, um, and then portraits being through genealogical resources. I, I really appreciate that for, I hope a combination of viewers um, would be genealogists and also art historians. So, I so. yeah, I, there, there are, there's a scholar working, I won't say who, but there's a scholar working at the library now who's researching her, her ancestor who is an Italian who came to America and was working as a muralist. And she's, her whole research angle is from the point of view of family history. So She's looking at these kinds of records, and 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 I, I heard her give a presentation a few days ago, and I was like, yes, this is it. Um, so so I, I, there's definitely definitely room for it. Yeah, no, it's it's just, I think it's it's great. You know, as an art historian, I don't always think of going to these kinds of sources for information about the things I'm working on. And then again, as someone with a, an interest in family. Um, uh -huh. it's just it's just fascinating, and yeah. it shows how rich the collections not only of you know, the library are particularly, but also just the, all the online resources. And we do have a lot of questions. So I just want to move through quickly. Sure. Um, <clears throat> what is the top hobby of visitors to New York Public Library if genealogy is number two? <laughs> uh, genealogy is the second most popular hobby in the United States. The first most popular hobby is gardening. Gardening. Um, okay. When people aren't gardening, they're researching their family history. It's We digitized the city directories a few years ago. Um, in the local history department, we pushed for them to be digitized and some money came along from a grant somewhere and then we digitized them and they were instantly the number one digital object that anyone was looking at. Wow. Um, so there's, it's a big research audience. It's not as tangible as other research audiences because a lot of people, they're not writing books. Some people write a family history and we encourage them to do that. If you write a family history, by the way, and get it banned, donate it to New York Public Library, we will take it. <laughs> That's right. Are census recordings different from city to city or state to state? You've got two kinds of census, essentially. This, 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 the federal census starts in 1790 and it's every 10 years. Um, it starts off, they're not asking a lot of information to begin with and they're using all sorts of different bits of paper. There's instructions from Congress about, there's maybe six questions. As the census goes along, they start standardizing the forms um, they start asking a lot more questions and the questions reflect the time. So, you know, big uptick in immigration in, in, in the late 19th century. So 1900 through 1930 asked questions about immigration, um, you know, and, and but before then, the early censuses is just about, you know, tax representation and, and militias. So it just depends. And then we get state censuses, which we don't really see so much of nowadays, I don't think anymore. They tended to be every five years in between and they were big from the early 19th century and they kind of peter out about 
early mid 20th century. So 1825, 1925 is the last New York State census. And then um, there's all sorts of other different kinds of census like population. There's the population schedules of what we're talking about. There's, there's censuses of farms, veterans, businesses, things like that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, it's a little confusing sometimes I know from experience, um, even researching places that, and, and who owned your house, if you're interested mm -hmm. in wherever you live, who lived there before you. And it, it's, it is a little confusing and it's nice to have someone like Phil um, show you through that. Um, this question is, uh, th does this information mainly refer to the US? Yes. Um, are there data about people from developing countries in Asia, to your knowledge, Phil? Um, we try to help everyone. We, we've only got so much money um, but we, to buy so many collections. But we are definitely, because America is America and it is, is, there are many diaspora here, many different groups of people here. We've looked essentially at some white people today. Um, um, some of those people, we didn't get into the, the Costigan family. Some of the people were recent immigrants. Um, some were all, older families. I think you could, I've seen there was one painting I didn't get around to researching because I, I ran out of time, but it was a slave plantation. Um, so there's different ways of looking at uh, different kind of aspects. And, and so, for instance, if we're researching people from China, um, we have subject knowledge. We're all about our subject knowledge and our collections. So China and Japan also have great histories of family history books, which are kept in villages um, called um, Jaipu. I think I pronounced that right. I'm sorry if I haven't. Um, so we, we definitely help people do all sorts of different research because different countries, different groups of people, different places, it just, they have different traditions for family history. Um, and and, and the, yeah, it's, it's, we specialize in helping people find information about their family, no matter what. And um, the Family Search Research Wiki is a great place to go if you want to kind of look, have a quick look at how to do research with different communities, different groups of peoples, and, and the kinds of records that are out there. Okay, um, we're gonna, there's a lot of questions um, to go. If people have to leave, obviously feel free. Um, feel if, if you do, email us, history, at, or email me, history at nypl.org. Did uh, everyone get that history? Maybe Phil, you could put that in the chat. I'll, but there yeah. are a few more questions if you can stay or do you have to go? I'm fine, yeah. I'm not okay, anyway. I'm so not we'll home. stay on and, and go through these questions if for people are interested. Otherwise, if you have to go, uh, history at nypl.org? Oh, ORG, yeah. At ORG, okay. Um, how do you go Thank back you. to the 1600s when ancestors came over to America? In, in three sentences. <laughs> well, you, you, start, you, start at the big, you start with yourself and then you work backwards, um, tracing your lineage, writing things down. You'll hit brick walls, but you'll somehow have to come over those brick walls. You can take classes in how to do genealogy research. You, you can find all sorts online. The Family Search Research Wiki is a great tool. Um, there's, there's classes on YouTube. We host classes on how to do this kind of research. And we do email reference. So if, you're, if you hit a brick wall or you're stuck in your research or you wanna know how to do it, what kind of resources, are out there, please email us. Um, we so I would say with the 1600s, what you're doing is, you know, there are fewer records when you go back to that time, but there are fewer people. Um, so the sources that are out there, you know, we're, we're looking at land patents, church records, things like that, but work backwards through the censuses until you get past the census into the colonial times. And then you're, you know, you're looking at different kinds of records, court records, wills, deeds, et cetera. Here's the opposite sort of question. Um, how would someone who's a first generation American citizen whose parents survived the Holocaust start researching who their great grandparents were and where they came for? Was everything destroyed during World War II? Germans have meticulous records. Where would I begin? I would begin on December the 2nd by attending Getting Started with Jewish Genealogy Research, which is a class I'm hosting with um, a colleague from the Jewish division. Now, if you can't wait till then, I, I would go to the family search wiki and start exploring. Um, a lot of records, you know, weren't destroyed. It's, it's kind of, there's a lot of mythology around genealogy research. Um, uh, and some of it's true and some of it isn't true. And it's, it, it's always a question of what is my research? Where am I going? So if you're doing G Jewish research, the Nazis, you know, they wanted lists of names. They wanted to know where all the Jews were because they wanted to exterminate them. Um, so there are more records than you think, but then there are records that went missing or there are records that, 
you know, for all sorts of different reasons, um, weren't created or aren't currently accessible. Uh, but I would go to Family Search Research Wiki and, and just explore doing re Jewish research. There's many, many pages on that. I would also think about visiting the website of Ackman and Ziff Institute, which is the, the, uh, the Center for Jewish History. Two librarians there I know deal with genealogy, uh, and they're great at that. Um, uh, or you can drop us a line again at history at nypl.org. Um, there are definitely ways of doing this research. Okay. Um, does NYPL accept submissions with data and info that could contribute to genealogical history of underrepresented communities and their members? Um, well, all we're currently able to accept is, is family histories that have been written and printed or, or a family history resource, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a question. If, if somebody has a specific collection that they're interested in sharing, there are, there are different ways of, of, of sharing information. Um, but at the moment, we're, we're really old fashioned. We're still only able to take um, um, bound copies of family histories that, that you've written. Um, and it can be in manuscript form. It doesn't have to be you know, published at all, mm -hmm. as long as um, it's bound. Someone wants to know, will the 2020 census have the same value as previous censuses? Probably not. There's fewer yeah. questions. To, to be honest, the nosier the government, the better it is for us. Yeah. Um, um, but hopefully what, there will be, I mean, th that whole landscape is going to be so different because so much stuff is digital now. Um, it, you know, so much is born digital. Um, but then, you know, we're building, people are building huge databases all the time in Ancestry and Family Search. So I, I'm not really sure quite what the landscape will look like. There are definitely seminars that you can go to where genealogists sit around and talk about, you know, about the future. But yeah, the census, it'll still, you know, it'll be more useful than the 1790 census. It will put a person in a time and a place at an address. And that will help you say, well, they're here and they're this age. So maybe they're appearing in these other you know, locations. I can't remember the census asked if I was a librarian or not, but, um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's something. Yeah. Um, what years are covered by the tax lot photos? 1940. Um, 1930, well, they were taken between 39 and 41. Then again in the 1980s. And then you see these, there, there are these other documents that aren't online um, um, called the tax lot files. And if a building's use substantially changed, they would retake the tax lot photograph and pin it to these files. But yeah, we're, we're talking about your building needs to be standing between 39 and 41. Uh, if you're looking for a building, and there are other resources you can use. That's a great fallback collection because it's, it's almost extant. Okay. But we, we have lots of other images of buildings as well. Um, do you have to make an appointment to visit the genealogy section? Um, when we're open, no, you just come in. We're a reading room. We're not a special collection, although we have special collections to a degree. All our collections are special, but um, it's not an archive, so you don't make an appointment. You can uh, make an appointment for a consultation. You can do that online at the moment as well. Um, if you go to um, www.nypl.org forward slash Milstein, um, you can get in contact with us or you can just write to us at history at nypl.org because sometimes we can do this by email, but obviously the reading room's not open at the moment because of COVID. Um, but yeah, no appointment necessary. Okie doke. Um, have you published anything on this topic? No. No, but we can see this well, video. You'll be able to um, see this video. Um, this video is being recorded. Mm -hmm and it will be available on the Frick's website in, the, um, in, in, in a few weeks time. We have a sort of little backlog at the moment from doing lots of online programs, mm -hmm. but this will be available. Um, let's see, uh, would you, um, I think some of these questions you should write to philip at history at nyp dot, at nypl.org. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, um, so it's NY, history at nypl.org. It's oh, on screen. Yeah. Um, and uh, some people in the question have put in um, some sources for Jewish genealogy. Um, how would you register for the online classes? Um, you, to register, because the, we do them through Zoom, you just go in and, and, and um, if you go to New York Public Library events, you just click the button that says register. Um, you know, there's no limit. Um, so 
it's straightforward. You don't need a library card. You don't need a Zoom account. Um, you just register with your email. Um, let's just see a couple things. Um, someone has a question about whether they'd like something, but I suggest uh, that you would like something she did, but um, I would suggest they write you. Okay. Um, someone wants to know what can they do to get better at deciphering old handwriting? Often it's illegible. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't used to wear glasses. Uh, I am getting older, but I was wearing glasses pretty quickly after I started this job 10 years ago, just looking at mostly at property deeds, actually. Okay. The, the best way is you just hope the handwriting is not too bad. Um, you could look for an alternate source if it's a transcription or something like that. Sometimes with some records it is. The best way to go is to scan the page. They're looking for words you know and that you recognize and then looking at how that person writing them forms their letters and then go back to that word you don't know and see if you can unpick it. But yeah, it's, it ain't easy. And, and for younger practice, researchers practice, who, who don't, know, don't know cursive, it's even harder for them. Yeah, um, it's a lot yeah. of fun. And, and share it, you know, go online. There's so many, there's a lot of genealogy groups on Facebook, for instance, or you can email us. Uh, we can't do translation work, but you know, let's say you, I was researching my wife's ancestry and, and um, one of her ancestors, he, uh, his naturalization record, he signs his name in, 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 in Yiddish and it's terrible, it has terrible handwriting. I showed it to people um, and they said, I'm not sure what that says. I know he had terrible handwriting, people that could read, read his handwriting, uh, uh, the, the language. Um, but you, there are Facebook groups, for instance, where, like the, the Jewish research Facebook groups, for instance, where people will happily do um, translation work, a little translation work, or if you just show it to someone else and say, what does this say? Maybe they'll know. Um, oh goodness, we're getting more questions. Uh, someone uh, put a resource up in the Q and A, um, nationalarchives.gov.uk slash paleography for reading older handwriting. Yeah. Um, this is another thing genealogists really love doing is sharing resources. Um, mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're someone who likes sharing resources, then you, you're gonna, you, you're gonna like, you're going to like genealogy. <laughs> um, I knew, oh, here's a question that's been here for a long time. He, uh, you showed an article about a child named Quackenbush, a captive of King George's War. What was the um, full name of the person? I, where was that? I didn't remember that myself, but I was hoping maybe it, I'll... It may have been a side story. Uh, okay. Uh, Wow, I can't remember that. Let me go. There's so many, I have too many slides. This is insane. I think it might be that. I'm not sure. Maybe it was in here. Oh, okay. I, I, can't could, see. Um, I would suggest then writing you at history. Yeah, I can write. Yeah. Yeah, dot org. Um, uh, I knew that NYC tax lot records were digitized. Do records exist for other communities and where would that be? Uh, what kinds of records? Um, I guess the person must mean um, tax lot records. I uh, think you have to go to the specific city or state that you're. Yeah, I mean, it's, it just depends. I, I would email us because this is what we do. We tell people where records are all the time. Um, we have so many records. We don't really keep records, actually. We, we, we have things on microfilm. We have surrogates of records through databases, but we know where they are right. nine times out of ten, or we can find them very quickly. Right. Okay, I think it's, it's ten after, and everyone's been um, wonderful and staying on and asking questions. And, Phil, I can't thank you enough. This was just great. I uh, enjoyed it so much, and I think our speakers did too. There were lots of comments about how wonderful it was, and I think you'll get oh, lots great. of emails <laughs> in the future. Yes, that's good. It was always good to get some business. <laughs> and I hope you all use the Frick Photo Archive as well, because I wanted to drum yeah. up. Phil had it's so many really, interesting things. It's a good resource. Like, the more I got into it, I mean, I, I want to, you know, there was, uh, you know, I was interested, there was some paintings of, of, uh, of um, some plantations down south. Um, which I was very interested, you know, if, if you're researching African-American slave ancestry, these, these kinds of yeah, that's images cool. of place are important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so thanks everybody for joining us and um, take care. Have a good evening. <laughs>